Welcome everyone here in our uh, this podcast of Ex Umbris. We are talking about angels and modernism. Uh, and can angels evangelize the modern era? So what do we think? With, uh, with me we have uh, Schoolman uh, Fawcett. Uh, what would you like to uh, say here about angels in the modern era? Uh, oh, goodness. Well, I'm thinking, Scholar McClarney, all about angels and materialism. Ooh, yes. So here, I mean, materialism. Are people still materialists? We teach at an online school, yep. Chester Academy of St. Isidore. It's all immaterial in a certain <laughs> sense. <laughs> That's right? true. Yeah. There's no brick and mortar there. And here, everyone listening to us right now is listening to our disembodied voices floating through the ether, right? And yet people are still materialists. Uh, obviously, yes. I'm being facetious. There's material substructure behind all of this, you know. Um, in this modern materialist age, yes. Dr. McClarney, yeah. uh, with the advance of science and all that, is it still reasonable to believe that everything is full of angels? I mean, it's a cool theory. When you first right. hear that everything's yeah. full of angels, it just yes. sounds like something out of well, a fantasy. It sounds like something out of Tolkien, right? right. But is that all it is? Is it sort of like, re you know, you know when you read Tolkien that the stars in the sky aren't really diamonds or something like that. It's just a cool story. Yeah. Um, but... Could it be, can we still defensively believe uh, in the angels? Or is it it's just an article of faith? God right. tells us there are angels, so we have to believe in them. Yeah. Uh, or, 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 or worse yet, oh is no. it wish fulfillment? Oh, dear. So, so we, we live in a material world. Uh, well, that would be the argument, at least. That's the, uh, the worldview. So people might, possessing that type of vision of reality, say, oh, yeah, your belief in angels is just wish fulfillment. You wish there were other creatures to help. I don't know, give you fellowship or mm -hmm. comfort or mm -hmm. some sort of mm -hmm. companionship in this cold, inert universe. Uh, is that what we're doing? Are we, are we just wishing? Uh, well, that's, that's the story people tell about the origin of the gods, right? Oh, people oh, had right. to try to explain away why there was lightning in the sky. So they came up with the story of a guy who threw around, kind of looks like spears being thrown, right? Yeah. So there must be a guy up there throwing spears, whether that's Zeus or Thor or right, uh, yeah. whoever else. Real, I would think yeah. that if we were projecting something, we would project nicer beings, okay. right? <laughs> uh, historically. Uh, but were you saying angels aren't nice? Is that what you're saying? I don't, I don't know. Well, would we have come up with the demons? Oh, right. right? Okay, the fallen would, angels. Who yeah. wants to believe in that, really? Uh, would, Good point. Yeah. Uh, but, well, you know, so we'll dive into this a little bit today. I've got, and, and I think we have a little less to cover today, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but I've got a few, I'd say the two major objections, well, I mean, that's really what it is, is it's, uh, science has, we spoke before, for example, about how in the medieval era there was this belief that the angels were pushing around the stars and the planets. Yeah, right. Well, clearly we don't believe in that anymore. That's quaint, uh, you know, pre-modern ways of thinking. So our angels are out of a job now? Is that what you're saying? Well, they're yeah. They're unemployed. Or they've they're been uh, downsized. Downsized. Right. They, oh, they okay. used to have the big uh, corner office yeah. right, running the whole universe, but now <laughs> right. they're just in charge of making me feel better when I'm scared. You oh, know? Right. right. You're a guardian angel. Yeah, yeah. a guardian angel, okay. yeah. Uh, is that the case? I'm going to argue today that it's not, actually, that we have very good reason and that a good, robustly founded ca uh, classical Catholic education should impart to students that, no, uh, actually, we have every reason to still believe in angels because of science and because of math. Oh, wow. Okay, so we're re-enchanting the world uh, via the sciences, via math. I, I, I like it. So. Okay. I think so. Well, don't I about So there's a, couple, uh, there's a couple of block quotations here. Uh, maybe Mrs. Wright can post these in full, I don't know, on the show notes. Uh, sure. okay. But I will read them all out here. Um, so, uh, Mrs. Wright, when you're listening, don't worry, I will email you these. Um, but let's, <laughs> Who's the first one from? Uh, well, well, let's, well first of all, let's okay, just review sure. okay. uh, Aristotle. Like, I mean, we talked about Aristotle oh, right, right, before. Right, right. Okay. Well, you recapped it in the past about Plato and the ideas. Um, yeah. uh, and hylomorphism, of course, is the idea that every substance... Every yeah. material substance, at least, is a composite of form and matter. Yeah, that's right. what hylomorphism. Hylomorphism, exactly. Means form and matter. Okay, good. Right, in Greek, there, right? So, um, for point of reference, okay, if maybe our listeners are not mechanical. Suppose, yeah. imagine you're not a very mechanical person, and uh, you pick up some kind of tool in a workshop or a shed. Yeah. Can't figure out what it is. You feel it. You touch it. Yeah, maybe you taste it even, Ooh, which is well, not so wise. Not recommended. Not recommended, although it'll give you quite an experience, I'm sure. <laughs> but you might, you might be able to analyze it from every single angle and still not yes. really know what it is. All right. So you've got all the material there. Okay. But until someone explains to you, oh, this is a carburetor. It, right. it performs this function for the car. Yeah. Well, oh, now you understand what it is. That's yeah. an intellectual act of apprehension. 
the material itself did not get you there. You can have right. all the five senses, every material experience of it you want. Okay. But that's different than knowing what it is. Uh, and in fact, there are some people who have, uh, for whatever reason, uh, they, they actually can't distinct. Like, you can give them a, a five-ended bag, and they'll feel it and feel it, and they'll not be able to figure out that it's a glove. All right? Okay. It's a, uh, interesting. Um, there's a Thomist philosopher named Eleanor Stump who talks a bit about this, this okay. phenomena. There's a book called uh, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hatch. <laughs> in the 70s. But like, it is a phenomenon some people have. Of, but, but it shows there is a difference between the material apprehension of something and the intellectual apprehension of something, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a different, a different thing is going on than just, just through material interaction with something. That doesn't tell you what it is. What it is is something beyond the material. It's its form. And right. the senses won't tell you what it is. Yes. Your mind has to get there. Right. Okay. So this is why Aristotle distinguishes between the form and the matter, and the form is immaterial, and this is evidence that, in fact, our minds are immaterial. Right. right? They're different than just our senses. Yes. Uh, and that's the case with everything in, in the material creation, is a composite of both form and substance. There's what it's made of, and then there's what it is. Right. Yeah. Now, yeah. oh, form, sorry. Form and matter. Yeah, form yeah, and yeah, matter, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, keep, yeah, this, yeah. keep this deeply so, in mind. And, of course, he's working from Plato, right? Yeah. Pla the forms are his understanding of Plato's ideals, right? Yeah. He just makes them more imminent. They're in the things themselves, right? Yeah. And, and we talked about the forms before, eternally in God's mind. Okay. Now, so I come across a carburetor, or, or sorry, I don't know it's a carburetor. I come across some material object. Yes. I have to then make the abstraction to the form, and there's this intellectual, what do you say, a leap there? Or there's there's some kind of Ooh, apprehension? Leap, yes. Or there's, there's some kind of interaction then with the form is, it, is that what you're saying like i when think you look so at material yes things? i think so well that's what aquinas would say that okay. our minds have to yeah. abstract the right. forms from the uh from from the material things right and that's yeah. and that's our whole process of learning any kind of knowledge because right. you you look at a whole bunch of different furry animals and you abstract that what they have in common is this form called cat catness right. whatever yes. right um, slightly different than Plato's, but he's, he's getting at the same thing Plato's getting at, that right. you, you can only have knowledge of forms, right? Okay. Something beyond just mere material experience. Okay, all right. Now, what happens if you subtract that? If, you know, if Ooh. you're a pure materialist, you're yes. a pure empiricist, a pure sensist, yes. um, well, then you just have the material. Right. Now, if that's the case, and I'm getting this from a Christian philosopher, actually. He's a Protestant, I believe, Peter Van Inwagen. Yeah. I don't agree with him on this, but I like that he's oh. consistent. Can, can, uh, before you get there, can we can we just back up to how did we get to this problem? So how, how, did, <laughs> how, did, how did we get to a world where it's almost a default position oh. is a materialist assumption is the working uh, rubric or the, the working lens by which we oh, analyze are we, are we doing a uh, one minute genealogy of philosophy? One minute. Do what, can, uh, do well, we, can, can, we, can we blame Machiavelli? For this? <laughs> can, uh, can I would not part? actually blame Machiavelli. I think you can blame John Locke. Actually. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, I think John Locke... So Aquinas and Aristotle are empiricists. Right. Of course, they think that all knowledge begins in the senses, but they think you can get from that sense experience to something material. John Locke, I would argue, my yeah. understanding of him is he's also an empiricist, but yes. you can't really get from there to... He's also like a nominalist, I think. Um, or there's something okay. nominalistic about it. Sure, right? okay. So all you then have are the material phenomena, you know, that, that comes into your senses. Right. right. Well, if you're consistent with that, you can only be sure, I guess, of what your material experience is. And it's worth noting, Locke also comes pretty close to religious agnosticism. He okay. has, in his letter on religious toleration, yeah. he was, there was pushback from Anglicans about this, that he says we should be tolerant of all religions because we just can't really be sure what's true. Okay. Right? So you can see that empiricism sort of leading to a kind of skepticism, and Hume goes there. Okay. David Hume picks up on this and says, well, yes. if all we can be sure of is our senses, we can't be sure of, we can't, we, you know, can't be sure of miracles. Uh, we yeah. can't be sure of causation, even. Yes. Right? All we can be sure of is that we see a bunch of correlations happening. Yeah. Uh, that leads to a complete skepticism, uh, which startles Immanuel Kant. My goodness, yes. how can yeah. we have science if we can't even be sure of causation? Which then leads right. Kant to uh, maybe create this division between what's really real and what our senses tell us between the noumena and the phenomena. Um, so you can be confident about the phenomena, but of course we don't actually know if the phenomena reflect what's really true at all. It's just what we experience and what works for us. Yeah. And that leads to pragmatism. That, so that, that branches off into a bunch of different directions. But that yeah. gets us, once you have that narrowing down, and it sort of happens at the Enlightenment, you could say, yeah. right? The skepticism about um, well, what, 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 what we can know. So, mm -hmm. so, so it's a narrowing down 
basically to what's in front of us, right? right. Or what, what our senses will dictate us. Right. I mean, if you're an empiricist. Right, right. And, and even though he's not an empiricist, I, mean, I suppose maybe this is what you're pushing me towards. It starts with Descartes. And a lot of okay, it. Descartes yes. starts by saying, like, well, we need some basis of certainty. Yeah. Because uh, there's so much religious disagreement going on and political disagreement going on. So we yeah. need something solid that we can be sure of. So, yes. Uh, and by getting there, we, we start with the method of doubt. Right. right. Okay. Uh, if I'm not sure of something, I could be wrong about it. I'm just yeah. going to assume it's wrong. And yeah. anything that survives that is the only basis of knowledge. Yeah. He means well, but that method ends up, uh, I mean, he's trying to save God and save faith. But taking that method of doubt leads to the, as Ricoeur would say, the hermeneutics of suspicion, right. and that ends up er erasing a lot of things. And in a scientific sense, uh, it means you can't be sure of anything that you can't immediately and directly perceive. Right. right. Okay. Uh, all you can be sure of is what your senses tell you. Yes. Uh, now, the problem with that is um, what Peter Van Inwagen says, because if that's the case, okay. then tables and chairs do not exist. All right, right, so tables and chairs. Well, who's Peter Van Peter Van Emmingen is a yeah. philosopher who I think he was at Notre Dame. Yeah. I don't know if he's still there or not. Um, and again, Christian guy, apologetic Christian guy, um, philosopher, and I think consistent. I give him credit for this. But in his book, Material Beings, I think he wrote that in the 90s or something, he argues that, okay, only in a very limited sense can we say that flocks of birds exist. Really? They, they exist in, in a temp, in, 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 as a, a shorthand. There's a bunch of birds flying oh. in a formation with each other. Okay. So as a shorthand for that, we can say it's a flock of birds, because who's got the time? Okay, because we see the V of the, the, the geese, you know, they form that flying V, or right, right. they go, they go south. Right, right. It, it, the V is emergent from that, but it doesn't, the V isn't real, it's got a very, very limited existence. Okay. Um, what would, to be more accurate, what we say, what we, what we see, I ought to say, is a, a bunch of birds arranged V-wise. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, or a swarm of bees. Well, it's really a whole bunch of individual bees arranged swarm-wise. And okay. it only exists, if we can even call it existence, for as long as they're organized in that. All right. So I can't, there is no hive, there is, or I guess, uh, uh, Well, we're starting swarm, with things everyone will agree yeah, on. Yeah, okay, like okay, right. so, or so, crowds, like a crowd, crowd doesn't have crowd. any independent existence. It's just All like right. a shorthand for a bunch of humans arranged crowd-wise. So it's some um, term that we use, uh, as you said, a shorthand, mm -hmm. to, as a shortcut to help yeah. help us conceptualize it, it, yeah. if what have, If you have five, well, what's, what's the expression? Two is company, three is a crowd, right? If you have three people standing, I don't know, five meters apart from each other, that's not really a crowd. You move them close enough to each other, then as a shorthand you say, oh, well, they, they're arranged crowd-wise now. Okay. Now, he thinks, though, if you push that, it's very atomistic. Yeah. That's true of everything. This microphone is a bunch of atoms, molecules, electrons, arranged microphone-wise. Okay. Right? Uh, our beards are just a bunch of follicles, arranged hair-wise. Like, you know, if you push it, right? Like, if you put everything under the microscope, in, in the, like the pre-Socratic philosophers were trying to do, uh, well, they don't exist. They're just a collection of atoms. Okay. Yeah. Maybe monads. Right, <laughs> you know, we're right, like right. right? Yeah. Which means they don't really exist. They're... There are a bunch of atoms arranged chair-wise, right. or TV-wise, or what other what other things are around me I can look at and give examples of. They're bag-wise, you know. Yes. Okay. That's where you have to go if you're really going to deny form. If you're just going to be a pure materialist, now to, for the record, that anyone would say gods and angels, God and angels exist, okay, because <laughs> they're not material and this kind of thing. But in the material world, yes. those things don't really paper doesn't really exist. It's just a bunch of molecules arranged. Paper wise. Oh, wow. Um, I think, like Descartes, like Kant, Van Inlegging is a, is a Christian who means well. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I think his philosophy is problematic. I think, in fact, uh, that's a, that, that ends up being absurd, right? Yeah. Clearly, those things must exist. But if you're a consistent empiricist, that does lead you down a road that uh, is well expressed by Quine. Yeah. Who's that? No, no, let's just, can we define empiricist? Empiricist would be just someone who just believes only in the quantifiable so mm. we can be put in the a observable test let's say right. yeah. yeah yeah so something that that well, we can measure right yeah so, yes yeah so well, something that. measurable okay so that's all we have that's, that's and, our, and what kind of sense it comes to our sense experience typically yeah you could also call senseism or sure. whatever so so any truth claims we're going to make about reality have to be verified empirically mm -hmm. otherwise there's no value in those statements right, no right. truth value 
in those mm-hmm. statements. Is that, is that, is that that's I what think we so, mean yeah. And that leads to like logical positivism as right. well, which is like the only sentences that have meaning are sentences that are kind of verifiable or whatever. So yeah. God exists doesn't mean anything according to them because it's not anything in our empirical experience. You can put so. it in a test too. Exactly, right. okay. yes. Now, right. Quine, uh, okay. Quine is a logical positivist, as I recall. He's, he's a philosopher of language, a modern in the 20th century. Yeah. Um, an agnostic, certainly. But he makes a pretty interesting comment. And, and to understand it, you've got to keep this in mind about what Van Inwagen just said, right? Is there's, that there's, there's you know, right, physical objects are just our ways of talking about, you know, combinations of atoms. All right, this is a quote from his book, The Verification Theory and Reductionism. Re- reductionism is the key word here. Right? Okay. He says, as an empiricist, all right, like mm-hmm. you said, an empiricist, someone who believes only in, you know, knowledge is only what we can observe and measure and experience. I continue to think of the conceptual scheme of science as a tool ultimately for predicting future experience in the light of past experience. This is important. Science is not about telling us what's real. It's a tool for predicting stuff. Okay. Okay. Physical objects are conceptually imported into the situation as convenient intermediaries, not by definition in terms of experience, but simply as irreducible posits, comparable epistemologically to the gods of Homer. Now, let me just try to translate that into a little more accessible prose. Right, okay, okay. Um, in order to effectively predict what's going to happen in the natural world, yeah. we have to use this fiction of physical objects. We have to talk about this thing as though it's a microphone or a chair or a computer or a cup. Right? Yeah. But do we know that they're actually real? He says, I guess that's what epistemology is. Epistemology is the philosophy of knowledge. Well, no. These are things that we posit. We, we put them forward, right? Uh, we suggest them and believe in them, but really, in terms of whether they're real or not, they are on the same level as the gods of Homer, which really? we talked about before yes. as being right. Uh, is, is this because if I zoom in on this mug I'm holding uh, at the a- atomic level or subatomic model, it doesn't look any different than any other object? I'm going to zoom up. Yeah, absolutely, on. it's just it's all just a soup of atoms. It's right? just okay, all right. Um, all right. But for the sake of convenience, we say, oh, well, this particular combination of atoms is a cup and it has its own but it doesn't really exist it's just something we posit this any physical object is a cultural posit it's the way that we as a culture have chosen to look at this particular combination of atoms oh, does it okay. exist we can't we don't know it's as unknown to us as the gods of homer okay. which as we talked about before yeah. are like the fallen angels and uh, you know, the, the spirits under whom God, the sons of Elohim under whom God put the nations, you know. Yes. yes. Then he says, that, let me interject. He quickly adds, let me interject that for my part, I do, as a lay scientist, or a lay physicist, I should say, I do believe in physical objects and not in Homer's gods. And I consider it a scientific error to think otherwise. But in point of epistemological footing, the physical objects and the gods differ only in degree and not in kind. Both sorts of entities enter our conception only as cultural posits. The myth, here's how he calls it, the myth of physical objects is epistemologically superior to most in that it has proved more efficacious than other myths as a device for working a manageable structure into the flux of experience. So I hope my, my uh, inflections there help that be more accessible, but again, to paraphrase, on an epistemological level, in terms of whether we can know what's real or not, physical objects and the Homeric gods are on an equal level. They're because they're both not part of our experience. Really? Okay, so mm-hmm. so again, this mug which I drink out of frequently every day, um, every workday at least, is, is just as real as Hera or Mercury or his Hermes, uh, according uh, to Quine. Like, is that is that what he's saying? It, it's it's a more useful myth. Because thinking of it as a cup helps you know how to store it and properly care for it. Right. Not right. it's a mug, so it's metal, so you don't want to put it in the microwave. So it's right. more useful for you. Yes. But in terms of, it, it, it's it's been better predictive power than thinking of it as uh, something with the what would the god of cups be? I don't yeah. know. There's a, I know there's a knight of cups in the tarot cards, but yeah, there's the um, oh, there's a. Uh, Cup bear, but anyhow, it escapes me. Yeah, yeah. I guess it would yeah. depend. I don't depend which culture you come from. But sure. Thinking sure. of that, um, the cup bearing bearing god as holding together all of those atoms. Yeah. Right. Um, why not? In terms of knowing knowing whether it's real or not, yes. um, you could think of that as being a cup, or you could think of it as having a 
the god of cupbearers holding all of the subatomic particles together. Epistemologically, they're on the same level. Okay. The only reason that physical objects are better is because it allows us to predict and control them better. Right, so I'm just making up this idea of cup. We, uh, it's a so cultural posit. We've it, made it up together. Oh, basically. we've made it up together. So yeah. we've made up this um, notion of cup, and so this is, uh, this is the... I impose it mm -hmm. on this material that is here uh, as a heuristic device, some helpful instrument mm -hmm. or, to predict what's going to happen. Or maybe it's real, you just can't know it. Uh, right. So it's on the same to... epistemic, epistemic footing as the Greek gods. Okay, right. so this is kind of back to the noumena in some ways, is that Absolutely, it? yes. So it's con can... con separation. All you can know is the phenomena. Is there really a god behind it? I don't know. Uh, I can't even know if there's a form behind it. Okay. Now that, of course, is leads us into abject skepticism, right? Yeah. Ultimately, which yes. all of this kind of does. Yeah. Um, but if you take the, a different view of this, right, and, and that's and of course that's the understanding of the ancients in a lot of ways is that yeah there is, well you know it, it may sound quaint to say that there are gods of rain or gods of lakes or gods of rivers or gods of mountains right, yeah. but if you kind of view that through the aristotelian lens of well what that means is that there's a transcendent spiritual principle there there's yes. a form there's some intelligent being that is informing this matter yes well that would actually let me put it this way let me, let's work backwards if you don't want to fall into that kind of skepticism of saying the chairs don't exist yeah. then you have to posit some kind of immaterial thing that's informing it of course yeah but where's that coming from Oh. Well, most cultures have experienced this as being something spiritual, which is why they all have gods to describe them. Or okay. at least they talk about them in spiritual ways, right. in charge of it. And there's no reason not to, at best, let's say, let's say at, at the very worst, there's no reason not to believe that. Okay, because that's what Coyne's point is, is it not? At, well, I think that's what Coyne is saying, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he, what he means to do is undermine faith in physical objects, I think. Okay. Uh, but if, I would say, if you don't want to be a skeptic, that actually bolsters our faith in the poss. Let's, let's be let's be conservative here in the possibility that there that all things are full of angels. There's right. no reason to not believe that. Let's start with that. Okay. All right. Uh, does that sound persuasive to you so far, or? Because uh, it, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. Okay, because I did believe in physical objects, even though I'm a hardened materialist. Uh, yes, well, least, there you go. Least, yes. I, I come from a culture that, that's certainly... Uh, that that tries operates. to be materialist, I, I, yes. This, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm still recovering from I'm, this. I'm so sorry. Well, here, how about, how about uh, while you, uh, you know, sort of lay there trying to catch your breath, you know, recover yeah. from this, let's, yeah. uh, let's, uh, <laughs> let's review as a reminder, right? Aristotle thought that the stars and the planets... Uh, well, let's just focus on the stars, because, of course, the stars okay. biblically are associated with the angels. Yeah, yeah. Now, again, is that just biblical symbolism? Yes. Maybe, right. but let's talk a bit more about that because the, again, Aristotle thought that there had to be souls in the stars for reasons that are that get into Aristotelian physics and cosmology and are not that important here. Uh, the Church condemned that in 1277, the idea yep. that the stars had souls themselves; they were right. like animals, yep. uh, but they still seemed to act intelligently. Yep. Uh, so the, co the common uh, explanation was the angels are pushing the stars around, and this and this worked right. really well because yep. it, it incorporated Aristotelian science. Um, with the biblical imagery of stars being associated with angels. Right. Now, do we can we still believe that, though? Because uh, Peter Kraft, and I'm very indebted to Peter Kraft, he's a great Catholic philosopher, yeah. a great yes. exponent of Aquinas, and wrote a really good book on angels. Right. Uh, he touches on this, okay. and uh, I'm going to quote him here. Because yep. okay. Kraft is sort of a... Uh, he, he's, he's willing to let this one go, right? Yeah. Uh, Kraft says that uh, the medievals thought this because mere matter does not move itself and the heavenly bodies move. And gravity was not yet formulated as a moving force. So we know that, you know, all this material stuff around us, it's not moving on its own. It's not, we're not in the, I don't know, like a horror movie or Beauty and the Beast, right? They're not, yeah. right? They're not coming alive and moving, but the stars are floating around and moving. So, right. what? but we know they're material, so how could they be moving around? Well, they didn't know about gravity, right? oh, okay. so right, right. what they posit is, well, there must have been uh, angels pushing them around, right? Okay. Uh, go back to Kraft. Aristotle discovered only half the principle of inertia, that a body remains at rest unless moved by another, but not the other half, that a body remains in motion unless acted on by another. He did not know that moving bodies on Earth slowed down only because of atmospheric friction, and that the bodies in the vacuum of outer space do not. Aristotle also believed a vacuum was impossible, so not having either gravity or inertia to explain the motion of heavenly bodies in Aristotle's science, 
the ancients used angels. So right. That's, that's okay. great. Sure. And he still believes in angels. I mean, he writes an excellent book explaining it, and I've, and I've drawn from it. Yeah. But he thinks that particular scientific use of angels, well, they didn't, kind of a, an angels of the gaps. Thing. Right. They right. didn't know about inertia. They didn't know about gravity. Yeah. Yeah. At the time, they posited angels. We don't need them anymore for that. Okay. Um, well, that's sad, though. It's very nice, you know, synchronicity <laughs> there with scripture to talk about the stars as being angelic and pushed around. Right, right. Um, so do we have to agree with Kraft, do you think? It's, it's, you're going to say no. I'm, <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to suggest no. And okay, I'm going to quote so, so, okay. an agnostic for this. But what no, do you think before I proceed? Oh, well, I think uh, Kraft's explanation is the one that most people are going to latch on to in the modern era because, yeah, we do have uh, things like uh, natural forces, uh, right? So electric magnetic force, or in this case gravity, mm -hmm. which can help explain natural phenomena. So it's this... Mm -hmm. Um, method of you know predicting uh, mm -hmm. an instrument right of what's going to happen next and uh, so yeah it has an explanatory power mm -hmm. so we don't need to then have some spiritual force mm -hmm. uh, I suppose that's behind mm -hmm. this uh, celestial body mm -hmm. but we still talk about constellations which is right. interesting yeah and yeah. I think of what constellations are it's sort of an idea of well somehow the arrangement of these stars these stars are arranged God wise Right, right. Uh, this looks like you know a, a particular god or a character from Greek mythology, so we're going to call it that. You know, okay. It's funny that we still right. have these constellations, uh, even if yes, we're materialists now. But there's an uh, agnostic physicist named Richard Feynman who said this in one of his lectures. Right. Again, a bit of a block quote here, but I think it's very intriguing and important. He says, uh, okay. "Newton saw from this, uh, talking about inertia, that to take a simple example, if a planet is going in a circle around the sun." No force is needed to make it go sideways tangentially. If there were no force at all, it would just keep coasting along. Again, in, you know, principle of inertia and equilibrium. But actually, the planet does not keep coasting along. It finds itself later not way out where it would go if there were no force at all, but farther down, towards the sun. In other words, its velocity, its motion, has been deflected towards the sun. So again, talking about the movement of the planets and the stars and the principle there. He says, uh, now he adds jokingly, what the angels have to do is beat their wings in order to, <laughs> towards the sun at all times to keep the planets moving. But the motion to keep the planet going in a straight line has no known reason. So he jokingly talks about the, you know, the medievals thought the angels had to beat their wings frantically to keep the planets moving around. But then he adds, but in lieu of the angels, we don't have a better explanation. The reason things coast forever has never been found out. The law of inertia has no known origin. Although the angels do not exist, the continuation of the motion does. But in order to obtain the falling operation, we do need a force. Okay. So he admits, there, okay, yes, there's a phenomena we call inertia. There's phenomena yeah. like equilibrium and all this. Right? Yeah. But that's just describing what happens. Right. Why is it happening that way? Yeah. Well, we don't know. And again, he's, he jokes, you know, at one point the angels have to beat their wings towards the sun all the time to keep the earth going. Yeah, but right. then he admits, but you know, we don't really have a better explanation. So, so we that substituted yet. that uh, a wing beating with, with this phenomenon or principle of, of inertia. Uh, and what he's saying they're equally plausible? I think very similar to Quine. Well, not just equally plausible. It's, it's that they're a different order of thing. Calling it the law of inertia is just describing what happens. But inertia is not a thing. Like, right. it's not a force in itself, okay. right? I mean, we call it a force, but it's not some observable... It's, again, it's just describing how substances are acting, right? right. How material objects behave. But what's okay. actually causing that to happen? We don't really know. Right. So, when are, are Chesterton... I'll oh, go ahead, please. So I was going to say, are we back to the Logoi? Like, like this is uh, part of the, the logic, the... the, the the forms that they got to set up in the universe, so the the laws then of nature Ooh. are resonant, um, resonate with with uh, the um, well the lawmaker, the logos himself, and, and so this is just a uh, part of that parcel of this cosmos in which the logos has set its imprint upon all things. Well, oh, I think so. Yeah, and this is operating accordingly then to this the, the logoi or the logic which um, Philo uh, would, would connect mm. to, to the angels. Right, I think, I think so. And that's what a form is. A form, I think its form is its nature, and its nature is the logic of why it's doing what it's doing, right? It's acting yeah. purposively, 
right? Uh, that's the, the final cause, right, of Aristotle's four uh, causes, right? Uh, so I think you're right. Again, we're back to Plato and the Stoics, right? There's some kind of logic behind the universe, a logos. Yeah. Each individual thing acts in accordance with the logic, even if it is itself uh, non-rational, yeah. because its nature is to do that thing. So its nature causes it to act rationally. Yes. Uh, so, okay, now, our, so what Kreeft and others, uh, Newton and so on, would call inertia, are, you're, you're saying then, if I've, is this, mm-hmm. is this correct, uh, you're saying that they're essentially, that's just a, a different term we use for a form. I want to, well, the effect of why a thing acts a certain way, right? Like, uh, these things have a nature, it causes them to act a certain way, yeah. and that phenomena of them acting that way we call inertia, or gravity, okay. or, you know, anything, or, or chemical affinity, right? That's right. just describing that these two, these chemical properties seem to have an affinity for each other, but, like, that's, that's their behavior towards each other. It's not, or attraction. Attraction is not, like, a thing itself. It's the behavior of these material objects, which okay. have natures. Yes. Right. Uh, just describing that phenomena is not the same thing as coming up with an explanation. I mean, that's no better than when the scholastics would sometimes say, "Oh, you know, why does this, uh, ca- why does this uh, poison have this property?" Well, because it has occult powers. Well, I mean, yeah. that's considered a joke now, right? Yeah, this, yeah. That's a non-answer. But are we any? Are we much better when we just posit forces and laws? I mean, that's just that's just as much a a label that doesn't explain. Okay. So okay. I would just suggest again that the door is open to say you know what, maybe there are angelic forces involved in making all this happen, right? Okay. Or at least the powers of God. You know? Yes. Yeah. Um, and I will conclude my, for my own part, just to say, uh, do we have any you know, positive reason to believe that there are angels involved with all this? Just a quick recap about uh, Kurt Godel, uh, okay. whose name I am almost certainly mispronouncing. Yeah, who, who's he again? Well, he's a much? famous mathematician. Okay. Um, he was friends with uh, Einstein. Yeah. Eccentric guy, I won't uh, lie, but he's very yeah. important because in the 20th century, uh, our friend Bertrand Russell yes. and uh, Alfred North Whitehead, yeah. they're trying to come up with a rational basis for mathematics. Okay. So they write the Principia Mathematica. They try to use this pure reason like to prove that, you know, from the ground up, basically, you can build up mathematics. Uh, we don't have time to get into it, but Goodell sure. refutes that in a way that everyone admits was effective. It's Goodell's uh, incompleteness theorem. Oh, okay. basically prove that there's an incompleteness in, inherent in any attempt to rationally build up mathematics. It's basically universal, as far as I can tell, that he reputed Russell and Whitehead, and okay. it hasn't been answered. So Russell and Whitehead were trying to show there's no faith involved in math? Uh, that's a nice it, way of putting it, 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 it yes. It's, it, there's no launching point. It, it, it can be from the, like, you bootstrap, pull yourself up. It's kind of, we can use math to create our own system, mm-hmm. which then explains the mathematical system. Yes. Uh, is, and Godel is basically saying, well, no, 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 you can't, you can't use math to explain the mathematical world. Mm-hmm. There's a certain point where you take a leap of faith. Yes. Uh, and, 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 okay. Something, I guess you could say non-rational. Has to be okay. at the foundation of it all. I won't say yes. irrational, but non-rational has to be at the oh, base of it Oh, what's the difference? Uh, irrational, well, it's like the Trinity, right? The Trinity okay. is not irrational, but it, it goes okay. beyond reason, let's say. Okay. Um, and yes, when we get into this level, I, I mean, like Plato said, you, you need to be a mathematician to yes. kind of contemplate these yes. things. Yes. Yeah. Um, but Goodell himself, um, you know, so it's left as an open question then. Well, how can we have mathematics and, and so you'll hear people say you know mathematics is essentially irrational because Goodell proved that there was no rational basis for it but yeah. you know he, he posited nothing else as an alternative well I actually kind of did and uh, I would point people to a book called uh, The Demons of Goodell uh, by Pierre Casson uh, how do you say that in French uh, N-O-G-U-E-S E with the accent oh that's a tough yeah, one yeah I was going to say uh, no, uh, no, no, no Nuget? Nuget? Oh, probably uh, Nuget. Cassou Nuget, I would be my guess. Yeah, I'm not yeah. positive about this. But his book, The Demons of Goodell, he says, uh, he goes through a lot of Goodell's no, uh, diaries and notebooks, and he says, Goodell mm-hmm. basically believed that there was a faculty we had, um, an organ tuned into a level kind of above our material senses. Oh, and that wow. clued us into the existence of numbers. So again, numbers, again, going back to Plato, going back to um, uh, Pythagoras, Yes. Right, numbers are almost divine because they're yeah. immaterial things that govern the whole universe. Everything acts in accordance with them. Yes. Uh, and even modern science, there's a, an excellent article by Eugene Wigner called uh, "The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Physical Sciences." I want to say okay. that even today, like physical science is so dependent on math, and math predicts things effectively. Right. Yeah. Um, 
they, they, you can discover planets using just pure math, which is what happened actually with uh, Neptune, I think. Before they had any physical evidence of Neptune, okay. mathematical yeah. calculations predicted there must be a planet there, and yeah. so there was. Right. So mathematics is unreasonably effective for something that, if it's just something we created ourselves, doesn't seem that would make sense. Uh, no, math, we need math for science. And the reason we know about math, these immaterial numbers, these kind of platonic ideas that rule the world, for Goodell, there's a special sensory organ that tells us about that. Not, not a literal organ, like somewhere in our bodies, but like a faculty we have. Okay, now this sounds eerily like a soul. Uh, Ooh, to, to I'm my mind, it, though, yes. Mind, is, is, is this... Well, he certainly, he's, well, he said that by the same organ we can know about the existence of rational spiritual beings. Okay, so... So he thinks that we can know about angels. Angels are of the same kind of thing as numbers. Okay, now does he just not call that a soul? Or does he... Does he to my knowledge, he, I'm not aware that he ever did. Oh, okay. Uh, right. Though it's worth mentioning, Goodell also does make a version of the ontological argument for God's oh, existence. An like Anselm's argument? Uh, like, yeah, it's, it's, his is more sort of mathematical, but it's oh. it's the same sort of thing. It's it's very much a mathematician's version. Of the okay, does this connect to uh, like Descartes' I'm thinking of infinity or, or something? Infinity? His version of it, I think, well, right. you know what, maybe we should have an episode about this. Okay. I think that All would right. be okay. an interesting yeah, okay, topic. Okay, okay, but topic. Uh, but uh, he's, well, he certainly believes in, he believes in there's God. Uh, yeah. Does he talk about souls? I'm not positive he ever does. Okay. Uh, but he certainly believes okay. in spiritual. So, so, so the sensory... Uh, I don't know if sensory is the right word, but organ in which we can apprehend mathematics is, is what, what he's allowing for or insisting on? Yeah. Well, the quote, I'll, okay. I'll give you the I'll sure, give sure. quote okay, in the book. Uh, the existence of an organ of reason, an organ of perception not tuned to the sensory domain is a recurring theme in the notebooks of Goodell. It's an organ tuned to another domain, that of mathematical, mathematical objects and of concepts. Goodell maintained that angels are of the same matter, of the same nature as mathematical objects. The only difference is that mathematical objects are dead, while angels are living. Uh, while, sorry, in Goodell's mind, the existence of angels is firmly tied to that of mathematical objects. Angels inhibit the mathematical world as our bodies do the sensory one. Okay. Oh. So, so, uh, so it sounds as though, like, yeah, he's distinguishing between our bodies, which are sensory, and some yeah. part of ourselves that uh, can do math. That can do, yes. Right. So basically, I would suggest if you're willing to believe in math, there's no reason for you to not believe in angels, too. So we make that metaphysical leap into the realm of the, A squared plus the, B squared leap into equals faith, C squared. Basically, yes. Yeah. It's a Kierkegaardian act to believe in anything, really. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in a, in a certain, I'll say it too. It's Father Stanley Jackie, J A K I. He actually argued that Goodell's math, Goodell's incompleteness theorem also applied to the physical sciences. That they all also are sort of circular, ultimately. But that's a, that's for another day. Point is. Um, yeah, if you're, if you're willing to believe in physical objects and in math, there's no reason not to also believe in angels. Uh, which means Chesterton, which I was going to touch on before, right. Chesterton has the chapter in Orthodoxy on the ethics of Elfland, of saying that, you know, we're, we're all in a fairy tale, basically. Our world is the same sort of thing as we read about in fairy tales. And I think that there's good philosophical, scientific, and mathematical reasons to believe exactly that. This is all enchanted. What we do in math class is enchanted. What we're studying in any physical science class, biology, physics, chemistry, is also enchanted. It's all full of angels, which shows a harmony that should exist between all their classes. Theology, philosophy, um, literature, right? Which is also uh, using the imagination to explore this angelic world. It's, it's all converging. And it converges through Christ, who should be at the heart of a, a Christian worldview and therefore of a Christian education. And angels are a way into that, too. I right. read angels yes. Christologically. Yeah. So that was all I wanted to comment on. What are your thoughts, Scholar McLaren? Uh, well, just, I mean, one thing that uh, quickly lost my mind is just thinking of the, the whole picture here of what we talked about. It's interesting how materialism itself, if you follow it to its logical conclusion, points back to an expanded world uh, view. Uh, or you're left with seeing absurd things, uh, like um, mm -hmm. there's no flocks of birds or swarms of bees or uh, well, there's also no bees and, really in a sense yeah, right? there's, there's no, these there's no atoms, bees or birds because there's collections of atoms which, too uh, no pun intended but it flies in the face of of our our uh, way of living right mm -hmm. of what we know is real or what we claim is real and so it, it it's um it it's almost that self-refuting but it's like a boomerang in some ways is it not uh, materialism, where it draws mm -hmm. us, uh, if, if we follow it down, it's going to push us back into, we need some other explanation, mm -hmm. which 
Uh, Gug Del does a, uh, his, his work here. It seems to really be like that boomerang is pushing it back to uh, Plato's mm-hmm. Academy, uh, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, and, and thinking of the dialectic uh, by which that's the, the process of exchanging logos through which we ascend to um, the noetic, uh, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, using the noetic. Um, Right, the forms, the realm of the idios, or the ideas. Yeah, which I think shows uh, the mysticism of everyday things that Christians should have. I mean, St. Francis of Assisi has this, certainly, but really in our everyday lives, you know, the, mon- the so-called mundane things, if they're full of angels, if they point us to Christ, if they're full of platonic ideas, uh, God goodness, what an exciting world we live in. And, and what, how everything should point us to Christ. I, again, like the psalm says, you know, mountains and hills bless the Lord. You know, lakes and rivers, right. you know, bless the Lord. Right? All of these things, uh, it's, it's funny, I, I would argue that believing in angels saves the material world. Right? It's not okay. that the material world crowds them out as we advance in science. Right. It's that it actually it saves our knowledge because otherwise we lapse into skepticism. Uh, y- you yeah, know? yeah. Or, or just seeing brute matter, right? There, right? Mm-hmm. There's, there's, there's no actual form to uh, mm. the material we're just we're just left with this hodgepodge of things we just invent uh terms to to try and mm-hmm. uh, capture what they are but but those are no more real than anything else mm-hmm. so so yeah it's interesting angels save them the material world in which uh in which we inhabit that's 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 what that's how i would argue that it should be yeah. uh we should view everything and teach everything Yes, and uh, on that note, I guess, uh, that's the whole notion of evangelizing, uh, bringing the good news, uh, the messenger, uh, to, to the modern world. Right? And this is yeah, a- absolutely. And I think that when you're speaking to somebody about Christ, and they sort of perpetuate this myth that, you know, there's a God of the gaps. We used to believe in God because we didn't know anything about science, but now God has no, no room left as science advances. Well, no, as a, fa- as a matter of fact, there's a whole lot of ways you can object to that. But uh, this is a pretty key example of no, in fact, you need a mysticism to even have science. Um, and for science to be meaningful, I mean, my goodness, for how much atheism and materialism tries to celebrate science, I find this a much more inspi- I mean, if all science leads you down is a road of you know, bleak, dreary uh, emptiness, yeah. uh, who, who wants that? Uh, this is, gives a much greater incentive to do the physical sciences, right? to contemplate the works of the angels and of God. My goodness. Uh, I think that would make biology class a lot more exciting if people had that in the back of their minds. Yeah, you know? Our chemistry, our, our in physics, and, you know, of course, yeah, and math, right? And absolutely with math. Yeah, yeah. So, Dr. McClarney, any final words before we uh, close uh, in prayer, well, before you lead us in our closing prayer? I would prayer? just say, uh, let everything that lives and breathes bless the Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen.